Sherry Hawk was born with intuitive gifts and had psychic experiences since childhood. Throughout her teens and 20s, she frequently found herself having visions of things that would come to fruition. As the years progressed, she recognized the profound contribution her gifts would bring to people's lives, especially in her law enforcement career. As a police officer, she was frequently spiritually guided while on patrol through a series of psychic events. Well, sometimes it's just a whisper, and other times it can be somebody blurting something out, video images, like snapshots, uh, smells, sounds, emotions, energy going through me. Sometimes the energy is so strong when it goes through my right arm and hand, it, it kicks it up, you know, and luckily it doesn't hurt at all, but it looks really weird. Sometimes they, they come in, you know, unrequested, uh, especially um, like around water. The energy really flows a lot around water, like in the pool, by the ocean, even in the shower. Suddenly somebody, you know, my spare guides or somebody else's sometimes will pop in and just start talking. Oftentimes when I'm communicating with a deceased loved one, I will feel a rush of their emotions, their love, their energy, their excitement and joy of being able to have an opportunity to speak with their loved ones and answer questions and help with that healing of words that weren't said in time or words that never got a chance to be spoken maybe in years, that they can share that communication. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful feeling. She did not always want to be a police officer. After spending several years in business management, she began to feel drawn to public service, specifically family social welfare. After some time of shadowing a social welfare department supervisor, I witnessed firsthand the destruction of the families with this unending cycle of violence. And I realized that being a social worker and coming in to help after the violence wasn't enough. I needed to do something to protect the children. So I, I knew that my calling was to do more, to come in and, and be a person who helps protect and prevent the violence that was destroying these families, this cycle of violence. So I decided to try and get into law enforcement. And at that time in the 80s, it was a male dominated career field and it was very difficult to even get in, especially if you wanted to be more than a meter maid. After six years of her quest to become a police officer, Sherry's dream became a reality when she was hired by her police department of choice working as a patrol officer. She always patrolled alone, so her spirit guide served as a supportive partner riding along next to her. You could say that spirit rode shotgun with me because even though I was alone, I always felt like I had a partner with me. And I think they really, really enjoyed the pursuits because uh, not the lights and siren, but we'd get, you know, your energy would get keyed up and then, but you still had to stop when you went to an intersection if you had red to protect, you know, the oncoming traffic. So oftentimes the person you were pursuing, they'd be out of sight, you know, you'd lose them in the pursuit. So then spirit would say, oh, turn this way, turn that way. Oh, I think they went that way. And more times than not, spirit would lead me directly to the bad guy. Also spirit was really helpful with investigations and suspect interviews. Uh, they'd be lying about what was going on and spirit was like an instant lie detector because they'd signal me the minute the person started lying. And then they'd start showing me a little video in my head of their exact details of the crime. So I'd say, wait a minute, you know, I think that this happened like this and then you did this and the suspect's jaw would just drop open because I was literally showing them exactly what they did. And it was great because it led to a lot of closed cases and confessions. The partnership with Sherry and her spirit guides would prove to be paramount when facing dangerous situations. I remember back when I was a rookie, uh, spirit really helped save the life of a veteran officer who begrudgingly came to back me up. I was doing a felony warrant arrest at a really a sleazy criminal infested motel. And it was so old, they, on the second story, they still had the old iron railings that come off. So we approached it. I stood in a defensive stance off to the side of the hotel door 
and the veteran officer stood directly in front of it and started knocking on the door. And all of a sudden, Spirit said, he's gonna throw him over the balcony. Sure enough, the door flew open and the suspect comes out and he goes, you're going over and lunges toward the veteran officer. And as he did that, it was like some kind of fight scene from a movie. I grabbed his arm, spun him around, pinned him against the wall and started to handcuff him. Meanwhile, the veteran officer just standing there in shock. And that is the absolute truth. The psychic alert had prevented what could have been a life-threatening altercation for Sherry and her backup. And it was the beginning of understanding how her psychic gifts could guide her to protect and serve. She continued to receive urgent warnings and guidance, video imagery, and even connecting with the deceased on police calls. Her most meaningful use of her psychic communication was in comforting distraught families. Definitely the DOA or deceased person runs uh, was where I felt my gift enabled me to have the most impact with the families. Officers hated these runs because you had to stay there the entire time filling out the death report and waiting for the coroner to release the body. So I would use that time because I often volunteered and took the run from other people to try and help the family. Spirit would tell me what to say, what they needed to help them and ease their suffering and their pain because this was likely the worst day of their entire life. So why I was filling out the report and talking with them and trying to comfort them. Oftentimes it was, it would happen where the deceased person's soul was still there and they would realize that I could talk with them. So they would start dictating all these messages and stuff. So I would say to, for instance, the wife, I'd say, well, you know, I think he would have said this or he would have said that. And, you know, and I'd start passing it on, but you know, in a careful way so the family didn't know I was actually speaking with the deceased person next to me. And then she'd say, oh my God, that's exactly what he always said. And then I'd hear the spirit give this little chuckle and then he'd go on saying whatever the rest of his message was. But it really helped them in that moment to know not only what to say, but to be able to deliver their words of love to him. Sherry's investigative skills and psychic gifts became more integrated as her law enforcement career progressed over the years. Eventually, she began consulting for police agencies with serial rapists, robbery, missing, and murder cases. Sherry now dedicates her time and psychic gifts to assisting families and investigators with critical missing persons cases. I believe that missing person and missing person murder cases are now the most important use of my gift. Being able to help the police locate and return home a missing person is great. It's wonderful for the family. But recovering a missing murder victim so you can return them to their family so they can have the funeral and they don't have all these unanswered questions, that is really very helpful in their grieving process and helping them to move on with their life. Most of us will never know the horror of violent crime, but for an unfortunate few, it is very much a reality, and its effects can ripple for generations, leaving families devastated and struggling with unanswered questions. But the truth can sometimes still be heard in the most unlikely of places, the victim themselves. My mission is to make that voice heard. My name is Sherry Hawk. I'm a retired police officer and a psychic medium, and these are my stories.
This case began in November 2004 in a quiet Ohio township. The county's 911 emergency dispatch received a call from the frantic wife of a man we will identify as John Doe, who had just called their home to tell his wife he planned to end his life by driving into a lake. She begged and pleaded with her husband not to do it. Please, just come home. And tried to get him to tell her where he was driving. What road are you on right now? But John Doe would not be deterred from his plan and ended the call. Mrs. Doe provided the dispatcher with the details of the vehicle John was driving and his distraught mental state. Immediately, an emergency multi-county alert was broadcast to law enforcement agencies. In 2004, we didn't have the same technology we have today, nor the vast number of cell towers where we can immediately start tracking your movement because you're pinging off tower after tower after tower. So when John Doe turned off his cell phone, the track stopped. He disappeared. John Doe was an energetic, healthy, and avid cyclist. He loved his family and outdoor adventures. This all ended for him when one day, while cycling, a crash resulted in life-threatening physical trauma that placed him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. The dreadful accident caused a chain reaction of painful physical complications and an evolving depression that led to his emotional breaking point. His wife then filed a missing person, actually a critical endangered missing person report, which is much like an AMBER report. It goes national and local, so all the different agencies have the same information about the missing person at the same time. Because of that, the Sheriff's Department, local police department, park rangers, all had that information and they could begin the search. Multiple lakes in the county surrounded by dense wooded parks and farmland proved a monumental challenge. The extensive search of the nearby park concentrated on the deepest part of the lake by a dam. The Department of Natural Resources brought in advanced side scanning sonar equipment to search the deep water in addition to search divers, but nothing was ever found. But just days into the search, Mrs. Doe asked a friend of hers who was a psychic to help find her missing husband. The psychic told her that her husband was still alive. And in fact, he was in his van in a nearby park with a large lake. So law enforcement did a complete search with the canine on foot and could not find anything. She then hired a well-known local psychic he told her that he was still alive, but had fallen from his wheelchair and was dragging himself across the ground. This led to another psychic-led search. Again, nothing was found. Two weeks later, I was working a large Midwest psychic fair when a fellow psychic that I knew approached my booth. She told me that she had just been hired by Mrs. Doe to join the psychic team to help find her husband. This psychic was receiving information that conflicted with the other two psychics who were already on the case. She said that she received that he had drowned, but he was in a lake two hours away in another state, and she asked for my help. I really felt for the wife and what she was going through and her attempts to try and find her husband. So I closed my eyes for a moment of prayer and meditation and then I saw a vision as if I was in the driver's seat looking through a large windshield. I, I could see the water coming up, filling inside the van, but also up the window. And it got darker and darker until there was no light coming through the water at all. And then I felt the end of breath. I shared my vision with the psychic and told her he was not alive. In fact, he had drowned himself in his van. Due to her commitment to never accept payment when using her gifts to assist families and investigators during times of tragedy, Sherry declined an offer to join the paid psychic consultant team. What seemed like the end of her involvement in this case 
soon became clear was only the beginning. Just after I had recharged from the draining of the energy and emotions from the psychic fair, I was relaxing and looking out my family room window at the rolling wooded hills, when all of a sudden this unfamiliar male energy burst into my family room. Hello, are you gonna help my family or not? I had no idea who it was, but he was extremely irritable and very intense in demanding that I help him. So I asked, who are you? I'm John Doe, and yes, I am in spirit. When I realized who he was and that he was not gonna go away, I asked him, are you in the lake? Yes. He began sending me images of a state park with a lake where his body was located. So then I asked him, did you drive your van into the lake from a boat ramp? Yes. Each time he spoke, he increased his volume and intensity. It was filling my family room. It was frightening, to be honest. I'm used to speaking with crossed over spirits, but usually they're excited and happy to have someone deliver messages for them. His demeanor definitely reflected that of an angry earthbound soul rather than one that was at peace in their heaven realm. This was the first time I ever had to set ground rules when I was dealing with a spirit. Bursting into my family room and barking with this aggressive energy was not how it was gonna work. If he wanted me to help, he was gonna to have to be nice and he would have to have enough sustained energy to stay with me while we talked and I got the necessary information. He agreed on the house rules and began telling me what happened. John told me that he took some pills before he left the house. As he drove to the park, he called his wife and told her of his plan and shared his love for her. Then he turned off his cell phone. When he arrived at the park, he parked at a boat ramp and he said he waited for about an hour or so for the pills to kick in and reduce his anxiety. I didn't want to be found and stopped. I prayed for the courage to do what I needed to do. There was no turning back. I knew that I would do it right this time. Then I backed up, opened my window, gunned it, and drove into the lake. There were so many search ideas from family, friends, psychics, and here I still remain. I wanted to be found, just not stopped. Please help my family. I never thought this would go on so long. Once this is over, it'll be better for them. They need to bury me so they can begin to heal. I didn't know if I could help him because there were already multiple searches done and multiple psychics involved in the search. The police said that they had searched the entire lake with sonar and that he was not there. So if he was there, I couldn't understand why no one could find him. They did not do the entire lake. They did not cover where I am. I'm too big to miss. I agreed to help him, but with certain conditions. He had to tell me exactly where he was located. Finally, get a map of the park. Well, I grabbed a map of the lake, which had several boat wraps on it. I had no idea that he was about to teach me how I could psychically take my hand and scan an area like radar. It's a skill I still use today. Spirit guided me to run my right hand over the map, back and forth in a grid-like pattern. When I got a jolt of energy at a specific area, I opened my eyes and then used just my index finger and began that grid pattern again. When I felt the second jolt of energy, I asked John, is this the ramp that you drove in? And he confirmed. Once I had the location he led me to, confirmed, he began dictating a loving letter to his wife and family. Tell them this. I love my wife and family. The knowledge was mine. The decision was mine. The deterioration ahead was more than I could take. I did not want to become a total invalid. That's not life. It's a slow death. Don't agonize that I tried to stop the action that I set forth. I don't regret what I did. Only the pain it caused my family. My love for them is deeper than the ocean. I have been blessed with a loving family, while others in my predicament are abandoned. If they were in my body, they would understand. 
I have years of trying times and years of love. I wanted to have control and final say over my body. I wanted to control my end. There is love there, long tried and true love. I am truly grateful. After sending the letter to Mrs. Doe, Sherry set off to John Doe's location with a strict procedure set forth by her own guides to follow. She was told to have a friend drive her to the location while she closed her eyes, prayed, and connected with John's spirit. She was then advised to pick up a heavy-duty retrieving magnet and a 30-foot rope at the local hardware store, paddle out onto the lake in her kayak, and lower the car magnet into the water to locate John Doe's van. Well, at first I thought, are you guys serious? Yes, they said. And I argued, uh, I don't think so. It's winter, it's in the 30s. Then Spirit responded in this reassuring tone, yes, we know. You will have to wear gloves and a wetsuit and a hat and a life jacket. I just sat there stunned. The day I was driven to the park, it was sunny, calm, in the 40s. While en route, John gave me directions as to where to go into the park and how to find the specific ramp he wanted searched. Once I got there, I felt his energy all around me. It was like a force surrounding me. I geared up, grabbed my kayak, dragged it down the ramp to the water's edge. Paddle out about 20 to 30 feet to start the search. I drifted away from the ramp, so go to the right. The roof of my van is about 12 feet down. I nervously began paddling in a grid pattern as directed with the 20 foot magnet dragging underneath in the water. Five minutes into the search, the weather suddenly turned on me. The wind began gusting, blowing white caps and two foot waves crashing into my kayak. The sky was getting darker. The temperature just plummeted. I was being blown away from the ramp as this wall of sleet and snow was coming in horizontal, stinging my face. I was freezing from the cold, scared to death. I was frantically trying to get back to the ramp and John's yelling at me, don't stop, don't quit. Don't stop the search. I'm here, don't go. I had not expected for the search to become so dangerous. When I got back into the warmth of my car, I made the tough decision to end the search. Please don't go. Don't leave me here. Come back. I was in tears having to end the search, but it had quickly become too dangerous to continue. As I was leaving the park, I called John's wife and told her what happened with the weather and that I was not able to continue the search and find his van. Despite me not being able to find John's van, I was sure he was there. I urged her to call the police and have them come and search just that ramp area. At home, with a blazing fire and a hot toddy, I was going over the events that had happened during the search. Just weeks prior, John and his energy burst into my family room, demanding my help. Now I was trying to process the experience and trauma that I felt when I was out on the lake. I was so grateful that I had Spirit's guidance for this search on this sunny day. And then it became terrifying. And then it was heartbreaking that I couldn't stay there and help John and finish the search. Mrs. Doe never gave up the search for her husband. On the afternoon of February 10th, 2005, the police department investigating John's disappearance called Sherry while she was on patrol. They stated they would not conduct a search unless she responded to the scene. Unfortunately, I couldn't just go off duty and respond to their request. So I told them, all you have to do is get a tow truck with a long winch cable and back it up to the water's edge at the ramp. A diver can go in and hook up to the van. The van's 20 feet off to the right of the ramp and you won't even have to do any more searching once you pull it out, because he's still sitting in the van. Hours later, while I was still on patrol, I received the call. The police did do the search, and they found his van exactly where he said it would be. When the tow cable pulled his van out of the lake, they found him still seat belted 
in the driver's seat. A huge wave of emotions went through my body. I was crying, I was shaking, I was saddened all at once. I gave grateful prayers for this blessing of having these psychic abilities so I could help him and his family. This was the first time that I was ever able to help locate a body psychically. This was so important because it validated the successful collaboration between a psychic, police, and detectives to help bring home the missing. This did not end my involvement because we were able to recover his body. John's family was able to have a funeral to honor him and say goodbye. John's wife invited me to come to the funeral service and to meet her and her family. And so I did. After the service, I met with the family privately to answer any questions that they may have about my communication with their father. As I was receiving their grateful hugs and thanks, I could feel John's energy all around. The room was just bursting with love. His energy was no longer the angry, desperate, earthbound soul. It was peaceful and loving. He was coming from his heaven realm. Soon after the funeral, I received beautiful thank you cards from John's wife and his sister. On February 21st, 2005, John popped in on me one last time. Thank you for bringing me back to my family. You saw how much love is there. Now they can all live on. After John's message, I was reminded to always trust my spirit guide's knowledge in the moment rather than my own feelings. I felt humbled, honored, and blessed to help John and his family.